Please welcome our two guests from the film. Uh, the first man did locations on the film, Rory Inc. And the other man was the production designer, Jeffrey Kirkland. So when did you first hear of the book and then the movie adaptation? I don't read books. <laughs> uh, well, you may not have read it, but... I, I, I heard it, but um, it was very interesting. I came on the picture a little late. Um, this film had a lot of people uh, in, in it uh, and on it. Uh, you talked to over the years, and you said, like, yeah, I was on that for a while. <laughs> and uh, some of us were on it longer than others. Uh, but it was um, it was an interesting exercise, and for me, I was coming in late, so I didn't try to read a book anyway. Uh, I read the script, uh, loved the script. It read uh, I read slow normally, and uh, it takes me a while. But the right stuff, phew, 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 phew. it was like. Uh, it was almost like reading quick dialogue. You know, when you read a book, and there's a lot of dialogue in it, you rip through it. The script was a little bit like that, uh, except that it wasn't so much the dialogue, but little pages of uh, cut to uh, capsule. Glenn orbits the Earth for the third time. And you think, uh, and then you go on to another scene. And of course, there are people in movies who count um, uh, time, schedules, money by pages. And they add up all these little pieces of pages, and they come to eighth pages. Into, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and the rice stuff was full of them. So you think, uh, you know, the way you read it, you're going to rattle through it, except you, once you take one of these little eighth pages of Glenn Earl's Earth and you start thinking, how long is that going to take, you know, and what's going to be involved? Uh, so it was, uh, it was, it was, it was um, a very interesting mm -hmm. challenge. Um, coming back to the book, um, one of the quotes I was given from the book, I, was, I started out, one of the first challenges I had was to put the, um, get the Pancho's Bar in order. It, it was like a major set and nobody quite wanted, you know. So I said to Phil, I said, uh, I'm gonna look at the, the actual one, which was rubble, it was barely even rubble. Um, and we only I need, had a couple of weeks to do it, and so uh, I said I need a bit more help, and then can we find a location that's got something there. And we found this old uh, ranch house of some sort that was falling down. It had a few uh, looked like there were uh, workers, uh, veterans. On, you know, a little more than plywood uh, divisions. Uh, and a water tower, I said, well, at least we got something here. Uh, let's, uh, let's, let's go with that. Uh, and so I said to Phil, I said, uh, this seems to give me a start at least. And he said, I said, uh, in the bar, what do you, how, how's the bar? He said, well, Tom Wolf says, Rat Shack. So that was my key. The, the most help I had from the book was understanding Rat Shack. Uh, and it's a, the other thing about the film that, from a filmmaker's point of view, uh, it was a film about the birth of high tech, I think except 
when you started getting into it, you realized it wasn't as high as everybody thought it was. The, if you looked at the, um, the cockpit of the inside of the X1, it was like hokey. Was well, a lot of those pieces were just guys standing there with a blowtorch. Oh, sure. Well, yeah, I mean, it was, it, 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 today you would go, oh my God, what's this? A lot of those planes were coming off the roof of the production office. They were just <laughs> models. And we would oh, that was, we'd uh, test them until they were all broken and then <laughs> fix them. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm actually later. talking about what the, what the, uh, you know, the, the real pilots had, the real guys had, yeah, and um, it was, uh, we, a lot of it was done very simply, very quickly. Uh, we had a cutout rocket ship, I remember, at one point, which was on the horizon for Eric Severide, because he suddenly turned up one day and we didn't uh, realize he, 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 we'd been trying to get him for ages and then all of a sudden, of course, he turns up and we've got to shoot it to, tomorrow. So, okay, so we cut out rocket ship at the far end of the airfield and uh, put a bit of steam around it. And that, was, that was it. So, for a high-tech subject, uh, we certainly, uh, uh, used a lot of very on high tech things to illustrate it. Uh, one of the most difficult, uh, and you, I don't think you really quite get it in the film, uh, it's a hard thing to shoot, and it's a hard thing to understand, was the, was the capsule itself. And a capsule was like a little, was a, not, wasn't very big, it was a cone with a you know, pointer on the end. But you got into this thing and you were, the base of it, the base of the cone, which was this, you know, the disc, and then behind that, the heat shield and all that. The pilot, pardon me, was like this. And he had, um, like a, a, a few instruments here and a window here. And it took me a long time to kind of grasp this um, because there were no drawings of the thing with it, with the guy in it. Oh, where the hell does he sit? Yeah. And uh, then I went to see the Redstone rocket, which was, by that time, was a, uh, it, it was a re ex exhibition relic, and it was almost falling apart then, because things out at the Cape doesn't, don't last very long. It's so um, uh, corrosive out there, and you could break pieces of, so there was a fence around it, but there was this redstone rocket, which is like 100 feet high, with this uh, little cone on the top. And then you put the two things together. You put this little cone with a guy with his butt on the end of it on top of what was essentially a ballistic missile. And you go, oh my god. These guys have got some real cojones. And you look, I look at this thing now, and uh, it's been a while since I've seen this film, and uh, it's just totally heroic, every one of them. All the characters were totally and utterly heroic. And when you've seen these two things, and you put them together, and you realize these guys, got in there and the, <laughs> the fireflies were burning his ass, but he didn't know it, you know. Um, interesting, these are just impressions that, uh, that, that just hit me this afternoon and uh, uh, having seen it again, it was... Uh, Can I tell one story about the book before you go on to your next Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, we do this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a lot. Yeah. 
history. We have a long history. Um, oh. Actually, before you do that, this is how Rory and I work. He's driving, and I'm in. I'm shotgun. I'm riding. You can shotgun. show him we're not working because he drives, and I. <laughs> then, then it's off. But no, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just no, no. while we we're on the no, it's good. Book, it, it's, there, there was one little. His Tom Wolf does deserve a little. When we were in the pre-production phase, mm -hmm. um, where he worked was, on it. Er, I told you people went, came and went on the scene. I came on with it. Was real early for a, you know this was in the initial. It had just been green lit, and we were working with a designer named Fernando Scarpiati, who did a lot of Ber Bertolucci's films, and um, so we were given the script. It would all happen very quickly. And in my office, I had a copy of the book. And when I could, I would read the right stuff. And one day, Phil, whom we were just, you know, this is the first time I worked for him. So we were just getting to know each other in terms of scouting and, you know, getting briefed from him. But he gave a very interesting thread. And it was funny. I thought of it a lot today as I watched it. This is the first time I've seen the movie in a long, long time. Um, he saw the book on my desk and he said, oh, did you read this? And I said, no, I'm not done with it. I said, I've been reading it as, as I can. Uh, he said, what'd you think? And I said, can I be honest with you? I didn't see the movie in the book. I, I didn't, I'm, I'm really interested where this is going because I haven't matched it up. And he said, um, the book I need you to read for the movie is, uh, Yukio Mishima's Sun and Steel. And, um, okay, I had never heard of him, didn't know the book or whatever. Went down to City Lights Books that night, got the book, read the book, and I went, ah. <laughs> that, that's the old switcheroo. And if you look, if you ever read Sun and Steel, especially the last chapters where uh, Mishima has his uh, experiences F-104 and, and all of that stuff, you'll see what he was doing, you know, and that he was taking Tom Wolfe's book and he was taking on this almost poetic Japanese book about kind of breaking the bounds of the earth and the, the desire, the overwhelming desire to do that um, physically and mentally and everything like that. Um, that was just always something that, that Phil would come back to in our early briefs. Then he fired Fernando Scaffiati, and I think he hired you, right? <laughs> <laughs>